Shalom, everyone. In the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Hello, my name is Lou White, and today we're going to discuss a topic that uh, many of us are going to have to endure that we don't even know about. And that is, uh, it's called white robes. And it has not in anything to do with wearing literal white robes. The white robes that Yahushua is going to give to his people uh, while they await his return, and then subsequently the armies that are going to come back to the earth wearing these white robes. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the first screen here that is, going to, is really showing you a nuclear explosion, or this is an atomic explosion, but uh, it's you know to signify the preparation for those who are going to go through the great distress, or Jacob's trouble, as sometimes the Christians call it, uh, Yaakov's trouble. Anyway, uh, one of the things that Yael, the prophet, in chapter 2, and quoted it by Kepha in Acts chapter 2, was, And I shall show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. One of the things that Robert Oppenheimer did, who was called the father of the atomic bomb, was he, he quoted the Bhagavad Gita and said that uh, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, when he saw that you know, this atomic bomb was so potentially da damaging. Today's discussion is based upon a text that's in Daniel. In uh, Revelation 7, there's the question, who are these dressed in white robes? And where did they come from? Okay, the white robe people. They're the, the blood of the dead saints, or dead set apart ones, the Kodashim, are crying out under, from under the altar, and they're asking Yahuwah, you know, when will the time be that you will avenge our blood? Well, the I idea that we're going to have to suffer to the death is not often talked about. But we are going to have to suffer unto the death. And that's something that we're going to have to be aware of during the Great Tribulation. And that's what the white robes are hopefully going to show you, this topic. Now this is a prayer that Yahuwah's beloved Daud wrote in Psalm 19. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing before you, O Yahuwah, my rock and my redeemer. And uh, remember as you study this, uh, our heart is our inner lamp. That's, what we, that's where your treasure is. Your heart will be also, you know. So our treasure is, of course, the covenant that's valued higher than gems and diamonds and gold. And that's going to be discussed first. Because whenever we meet, we're supposed to discuss his Torah, which is his instructions. These are all pieces of the restoration puzzle. Because we're restoring and reclaiming the name. And of course, we can't do that if we're outside his covenant because he won't let us. We're still in captivity still, though. I mean, we're you know, in captivity in the nations. Even if we do take ourselves physically back to the land, we're not returned yet. He, he has to return us. Now, in Psalm 119, how would a, the question is asked, how would a young man cleanse his path to guard it according to your word? I have sought you with all my heart. Let me not stray from your commands. I have treasured up your word in my heart, your lamp, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Yahuwah. Teach me your laws. With my lips I have recounted all the right rulings of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your witnesses as over all riches. 
I meditate on your orders and regard your ways. I delight myself in your laws. I do not forget your word. There's a lot of terms there that are all pointing to the Torah. Word, ways, laws, witnesses, right rulings. Now it says, with my lips I have recounted all the right rulings of your mouth. When Yahuwah was at Sinai, he actually recounted these, you know, or, you know, not recounted, but he actually spoke these words, which we're about to see. This is the retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes of Israel in the last days, given at Deuteronomy 5. Number one, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you so that your days are prolonged, and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now this is the Shema that most Israelites are familiar with. It's recorded at Debarim or De Deuteronomy 6, starting at verse 4. Hear, O Yisrael, the word here is the word Shema. That also means to obey. Hear, listen, and obey. Um, and that has to do with Revelation too, when he said, he who has ears, let him hear. Yahuwah, your Elohim, Yahuwah is one. Perfect place for him to tell us if he was two or three. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart and you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So those commandments that he's referring to were just back there. We just finished reading them. We, we haven't broken stride at all. So there's no doubt which commandments he's talking about, you know. Now, the first mention in scripture of white robes is uh, apparently in Mark 16. And, and very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb for us? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was extremely large. And having, erected, ent having er entered into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right, 
wearing a white robe. And they were greatly astonished. And he said to them, do not be much astonished. You seek Yahushua of Nazareth, who was impaled. He was raised, he is not here. See the place where they laid him. And go say to his taught ones and Kepha that he is going before you into Galil. You shall see him there as he said to you. And then again in Revelation 3, there's a mention of white robes. And to the messenger of the assembly in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of Elohim and the seven stars says this, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before Elohim. Remember then how you have received and heard, and watch and repent. If then you do not wake up, I shall come upon you as a thief, and you shall not know at all what hour I come upon you. Nevertheless, you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, because they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be dressed in white robes, and I shall by no means block out his name from the book of life, but I shall confess his name before my Father and before his messengers. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. So there's a mention of white robes in the second place. Now Revelation 4, just another couple of chapters, says, And immediately I came to be in the Spirit, and saw a throne set in the heaven, and one sat up on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a ruby stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, dressed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Well, those elders, we already know who they are, you know. Those are people who have already been slain. And some have probably died natural deaths, but most of them died for the testimony of Yahushua and the commandments of Elohim. Because living in the world in many times and places was a uh, you know, it, it was the death penalty to have any other deities other than the ruler, you know. Now, who are these dressed in white robes? In Revelation 7, 13, we begin to read this. And one of the elders responded, saying to me, who are these dressed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, these are those coming out of the great distress having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are before the throne of Elohim and serve him day and night in his dwelling place. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tent over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun strike them nor any heat, because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them and lead them to fountains of waters of life and Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. They were killed. They were uh, people that were killed for their witness. Okay? Now, this is going to happen again, and it's, it, it continues to happen in various parts of the world now. But uh, it's going to happen again in a widespread way. What do the white robes represent? They're not literally white robes, are they? But they may have that appearance in prophecy. You know. Now, Revelation 19 explains, And after this I heard a loud voice of a great crowd in the heaven saying, Hallelujah, deliverance and esteem and respect and power to Yahuwah our Elohim. Because true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great horror who corrupted the earth with her whoring, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Okay? So don't think that we're going to not be suffering. Some of us are going to have to actually, uh, in peace, go to our deaths because we were witnessing. 
And a second time they said hallelujah, and her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped Elohim, who sat on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. Now this is when he actually takes control of the earth. So we see the white robes are, you know, and, and who's, what's happened to them, you know. And a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our Elohim, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as the voice of a great crowd, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for Yahuwah El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife prepared herself. And to her, it was given to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousnesses of the set-apart ones. In other words, when we obey the commandments and teach them to others, then that is our white robes. Now, when we read things like to the end in the text, it means to the death. Matthew 10, Yahushua speaking, See, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. What happens when you send sheep out into the midst of wolves? Anybody? Uh, it's bad news. Therefore, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be beware, beware of men, for they shall deliver you up to Sanhedrins and flog you in their congregations. And you shall be brought before governors and sovereigns for my sake as a witness to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it shall be given to you in that hour what you shall speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking in you. And brother shall deliver up brother to death, and a father his child. And children shall rise up against parents, and shall put them to death. And you shall be hated for all for my name's sake. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. And Matthew 10 continues, And when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For truly I say to you, you shall by no means have gone through, all the, through the cities of Israel before the Son of Adam comes. A taught one is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. In other words, what he's telling us is, don't think that we're going to be able to escape what they, how they treated him. He's saying that exactly what he received is what we can expect to receive as well. For it is enough for the taught one to become like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house, a pagan deity's name, how much more those of his household. Therefore, do not fear them. For whatever is covered shall be revealed, and whatever is hidden shall be made known. What I say to you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the being. That's your other component. No, in other words, even the adversary can't harm you, because he, he can only kill your body. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both being and body in Gehenna. And do not, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground without your father. And even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him I shall also confess before my father who is in the heavens. But whoever shall deny me before men, him I shall also deny before my Father who is in the heavens. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace with a sword, for I have come to bring division, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies are those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his staff and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life 
shall lose it. And he who, that has lost his life for my sake shall find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So uh, throughout history, a lot of the Catholics, which was basically the only semblance of the remaining faith on the earth at, at one time, there were probably others uh, in small numbers of the truth, but they were out killing people. They, he's not sending us out to kill people. He's saying that our enemies are going to kill us. And that's throughout all time. In Revelation 6 it says, And when he appoint, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the beings of those having been slain for the word of Elohim and for the witness which they held. That's witness about Yahushua. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Master, set apart and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So we don't avenge our blood. He does. And there was given to each one a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brothers who would be killed as they were was completed. Um, yes. Yes. Um, okay. It says, uh, "How long will Master set apart and true? You judge. How long till you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on earth? Who are these people?" It says, um, "I mean, are these the first fruits that uh, Yeshua took up with him when he did the waving of the sheep offering? Is that?" These are that are uh, speaking these words because it says, uh, he tells in response, he's like, uh, no, you got to wait just a little bit longer till uh -huh. everyone that is to be killed is killed. That's what he's saying. Everybody has to be killed that's going to be killed. Right. And that includes the 144,000. But who are these people? Those are the people, now they're, the, when we see them, Say, the they don't apparently have actually speak, they're not actually conscious because they haven't been resurrected yet. But what that is, is the blood of those people is crying out from the earth okay. and it's speaking to Yahushua. Okay, well, when Yeshua was crucified, it says the graves were open and yeah, yeah, there were yeah. many that were resurrected at that point. Does it say how many? Mm -hmm, uh, or mm -hmm. who they were. Yes, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, Do but that's not the first. Them? Well, that's not the first resurrection. The first resurrection occurs at his return. And I don't know what the translations are actually meaning, but some have said that those graves that were opened and they had people that were seen. Yes. Yeah, yeah it, they were actually. I they mean, some people around. said that they were actually dead oh. people that were known that were actually seen walking around. And I don't, I don't have an explanation for that. I don't know anybody that does. But if we try to make it one way or another, we're going to probably be at some, at some degree in error. But some have said that the, the bodies were just launched out of the ground and they were, people recognized them. But it, I think they were walking around. I think people were walking around. But that can't be the first resurrection either. But it may include these people because they were systematically killing people, you know, all through. Oh, yeah. And even oh, after yeah. Yahushua was executed, oh, yeah. Shaul was one of the chief people that were sent out with letters to arrest the Nazarim and then drag them back and stone them, you know. So there were lots and lots of people being stoned and, and executed. Uh, the Romans, you know, they were killing people too. But, uh, you know, who those people are, uh, that, their identities, I don't know anybody that could really say that they know. Well, I don't mean their identity such as their name. Yeah, I'm but... talking about... Uh-huh. Um, but they were slain for the word of Elohim. and They were slain for the word of Elohim and the witness Clearly. which they held. Clearly. That's what it... That's the main point that he wants us to make. But uh, he doesn't give us a lot of detail to, to know. Who, the, who these people are or where they are now or any of that, but we know that there's been people that have passed into the third heaven like Eliyahu and you know went up with the chariot of fire. 
escorted by no doubt Malachim, because that's what the chariot probably was. It was probably Malachim. You know, there wasn't a physical chariot. We know that you can't go into. But uh, you know, those are all things that we don't know much of the details on. You know, but it would be nice. Those are good questions, and but it's not going to really help us too much, even knowing who they are, but we have to know what we're going to have to go through because we're going to have to go through that. That's what my point is today, is we're going to actually have to be, some of us, actually killed. You know, they're going to, they're going to execute us. Yeah. Yes? Um, would, would Abel, the first man that was killed... Mm -hmm. He would probably be one of those. And many that, others. He yeah. might be in that. Mm. Because it mentions that when Mm -hmm. Offering, there were first says him the first fruits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, the resurrection of the first fruits, uh, the first resurrection is the one we're all shooting for to be in because the second resurrection is the great right, white throne judgment. So you're either in one or the other, you know. Uh, now apparently these people are not conscious. This is their blood crying out, but. It isn't impossible that they are conscious and they're with him in some place that we don't know about. I mean, you know, there's conversations that we've seen where Abraham was talking, you know, with Lazarus or Eleazar, and you know, there was there was the rich man whose name isn't given to us, and uh, you know, uh, all those things are possible, you know, but they're not in this particular dimension, you know. Anyway. Um, now, persecution in, in, would certainly include or mean to the death. Persecution is serious because the hatred level is just off the, sc off the scale. The dragon, who is the Nazarene's enemy and Israel's enemy and Yahushua's enemy, the dragon is the one who is the father of lies and he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy the creation. He, if he had the power to, to destroy creation, he would do it. Anyway, in Matthew 5 it says, Blessed are those persecuted for righteousness sake, because theirs is the reign of the heavens. And righteousness is the Hebrew word tzedakah. Uh, and the white robes represent the tzedakah, the, the righteousness of the saints. In 1 Peter, it says we're going to share in the sufferings. Beloved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that is coming upon you to try you, as though some unusual matter has befallen you. But as you share Messiah's sufferings, rejoice in order that you might rejoice ex exultingly at the revelation of his esteem. Now you can also see Romans 8:17, 2 Corinthians 1:5, and Philippians 3:10. Now the, re the revelation of Yahushua Hamashiach is his return. When he is revealed, then the kings of the earth and the mighty ones of the earth are going to cry out to the rocks and say, "Fall on us and hide us." Anyway, um, for right now they're hurting his people and doing everything, but they're going to hurt us even worse. And, but we don't have to fear the one who can kill the body because we're not going to be harmed at all. Not a hair on our head is to be harmed. And by that, he doesn't mean the literal hair of your head. That's just a metaphor. You know, your hair on your physical head can be harmed, but not the hair on your, on your spiritual head, you know. I hope I look a lot younger. Anyway, Luke 21 begins uh, at, chat, at verse 5 and says, And as some were speaking about the set-apart place, that's the temple, that it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, These that you see, the days are coming in which not one stone shall be left upon another that should not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Teacher, w but when shall this be? And what is the sign when this is about to take place? See that you are not led astray, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am, and the time is near. Then do not go after them. But when you hear of fightings and unrests, do not be alarmed, for these have to take place first. But the end is not immediately. 
Then he said to them, Nations shall rise against nation, and reign against reign, and there shall be great earthquakes in various places, and scarcities of food and deadly diseases, and there shall be horrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the congregations and prisons, and be brought before sovereigns and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn out to you for a witness. Therefore resolve in your hearts not to premeditate on what to answer. For I shall give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adv adversaries shall not be able to refute or resist. And you shall also be betrayed by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you shall be put to death. And you shall be hated by all because of my name but not a hair of your head shall be lost at all. Possess your lives by your endurance. And when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its laying waste is near. And don't take that to just mean one time, like in 70 CE. It, could me, it means any time, you know, in the future. Then let those in Yehuda flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of her go out, and let not those who are in the fields enter her, because these are days of vengeance, to, to fill all that has been, have, have been written. And woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing children in those days, for there shall be great distress in the earth and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are filled. So we know that it has happened once. They've been drug away and sent into the nations. And they're not to return or certainly go back into the city or the land until he returns them, you know. Many people are thinking, should I move back to Israel? You know, no, you should enjoin to the covenant and wait for his return. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and stars and on the earth anxiety of nations in bewilderment at the roaring of the sea and agitation, men fainting from fear and the expectation of what is coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Uh, my first photograph was the powers of the heavens being shaken in one way, the big bomb that we saw going off. And then they shall see the son of Adam coming in a cloud with power and much esteem. And when these matters begin to take place, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Now, he says, remember the word that I said to you. And he's talking to us. In Yahukanan or John 15, it says, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they shall persecute, persecute you too. If they have guarded my word, they would guard yours too. But all this they shall do to you because of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I did not do among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have both seen and have hated both me and my father. But that the word might be filled, which was written in their Torah, they hated me without a cause. And when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of the truth, who comes from the father, he shall bear witness of me. But you also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. In Romans 8, we see that we're going to be suffering with him in his sufferings. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of Elohim. And if children also heirs, truly heirs of Elohim and co-heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we also be exalted together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the esteem that is to be revealed in us. For the intense longing of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of Elohim. For the creation was subjected to futility, not from choice, but because of him who subjected it, 
in anticipation that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage to corruption into the esteemed freedom of the children of Elohim. For we know that all the creation groans together and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only so, but even we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For in this expectation we are saved, but expectation that is seen is not expectation, for when, we, we, when anyone sees, does he expect it? And if we expect what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with endurance. And in the same way, the Spirit does help in our weakness, weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case for us with groanings unutterable. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the set-apart ones, according to Elohim. And we know that all matters work together for good to those who love Elohim, to those who are called according to his purpose. Because those whom he knew beforehand, he also ordained beforehand to be conformed to the likeness of his son, for him to be the firstborn among many brothers, by whom he ordained beforehand. These he also called, and whom he called, these he also declared right, and whom he declared right, these he also esteemed. What then shall we say to this? If Elohim is for us, who is against us? We walk by faith, not by sight. Truly he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up on behalf of us all, how shall he not, along with him, freely give us all else? Who shall bring any charge against Elohim's chosen ones? It is Elohim who is declaring right. Who is he who is condemning? It is Messiah who died, and furthermore is also raised up, who is also at the right hand of Elohim, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of the Messiah? Shall pressure, or distress, or persecution, or scarcity of food, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it has been written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are reckoned as sheep of slaughter. But in this, we are more than overcomers through him who loved us. For I am persecuted, uh, no, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor messengers, nor principalities, nor powers, neither the present nor the future, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in Messiah Yahusha, our master. Now some have dressed themselves in white robes to masquerade. And here we have uh, an example of someone wearing a white robe. And um, here's some white robes in the, uh, the, some kind of a religious convention. And here's a gentleman over here who uh, probably is thinking bad thoughts. And here's the Olympic Games celebration. Uh, they like to dress in white. And here's another, uh, these are the guardians of the sacred flame who are practicing lighting the altar of this pagan Greek deity. And they're wearing white robes. And here's uh, the inspector. Is that Columbo? Yeah, he was saying, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> here we go again with that pagan stuff. And here's some jihadists that are at work wearing white robes. Children of the devil often masquerade in white. In 1 John 3, we see in this the children of Elohim and the children of the devil are manifest. In other words, they're revealed or made, made known. Everyone not doing righteousness is not of Elohim, neither the one not loving his brother. So what does the white robe represent? It's righteousness. So if you're seeing someone obeying the commandments, then they have white robe on them even then. I mean, the white robe is their righteousness. All right. Now, Matthew 12 at 33 begins and says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree rotten and its fruit rotten. For a tree is known by its fruit. 
It's the identifying factor. Brood of adders, how are you able to speak what is good, being wicked? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his heart. And the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the wicked treasure. And I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be declared righteous, and by your words you shall be declared unrighteous. And you store the Torah in your heart, and out of that, tor out of that store chamber, you know, your treasure chamber, you bring forth the good things, you know. Um, in Deuteronomy 4, we're reminded of this. For what great nation is there which has Elohim so near to it as Yahuwah, our Elohim, is to us whenever we call on him? And what great nation is there that has such laws and righteous right rulings like all this Torah, which I set before you this day? Only guard yourself and guard your life diligently, lest you forget the words your eyes have seen, and lest they turn aside from your heart all the days of your life. And you shall make them known to your children and your grandchildren. The day when you stood before Yahuwah your Elohim in Horeb, Yahuwah said to me, Assemble the people to me, and I make them hear my words, so that they learn to revere me all the days they live on the earth, and teach them to their children. That's important to understand. Do not let this book of the Torah depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you guard to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and act wisely. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, nor be discouraged, for Yahuwah your Elohim is with you wherever you go. And Yahusha himself said, And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. In Revelation 19, And I heard as the voice of a great crowd, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for Yahuwah El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife prepared herself. Now, that great nation is his wife, and that wife is Israel. Don't let the replacement theology where Christianity has taken over uh, and claimed to be Israel, don't let them fool you, you know. Now in Revelation 19, it continues, and the armies in the heaven, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horses. Every eye will see him coming, and with him will be his set apart ones, uh, innumerable in number, wearing white robes. And on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, the ones that would not obey his covenant. And he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of El Shaddai. It's going to be a horrendous, scary day when he comes back. But we're looking forward to it. So the white robes are our righteousness, and we need those white robes uh, at all times. But uh, interestingly enough, the, the people that are teaching against the commandments, are they outnumber us, and they've got a bigger microphone than I have. And uh, they're getting a lot more media attention, you know, and they're you know, parading people in front of them uh, to meet them. I mean, we saw that on the other video today. They were all, all the leaders of the other religious groups were all going to the dragon to honor the power that resided in him. Any uh, other comments or questions? Uh, I don't know. Speaking at the book, yeah, you weren't here. They had a video on it, yeah. It was political people? No, it was a bunch of uh, people that were like the heads of various denominations that were going to pay homage to the Pope when he was in. United States. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's about all I, I have today. My only love, hold me in your arms again. Take me now, and don't whisper to me. Tell me you care, because your love is
Deeper than the deepest sea. 